ultimately mentorship matters and it can probably make miracles happen. Uh, things that are that you otherwise thought were impossible. Those who are mentored are earning more, they're getting promoted more often, they enjoy their career more, they have less burnout. And it's, it's not just about what's so great for the person being mentored, it's also great for the organization because somebody who, uh, an employee, when they leave, it costs a lot of money to replace them. Mm -hmm. So having them mentored, it's actually a great retention tool because those who are mentored are more likely to stay with the organization and they're going to do their greatest work because remember, they're happy at work. Hello and welcome to the All Out Coach Podcast. My name is Tim Michalashvili. I'm your host, also CEO and co-founder of Amadev Pharma, a life science analytics agency that is bringing sportsmanship to data science in the pharmaceutical industry to transform both a patient and employee experience. Every conversation here on the All Out Coach Podcast is an opportunity to be inspired, to connect, to change your ideas or your outlook on you know our, our world and it's particularly exciting to have a repeat guest because we get a chance to understand how their ideas have changed how they're continuing to stretch themselves and lift others which is the slogan on this show today it is truly an honor to have dr ruth gotian return to the all out coach podcast talk about a new book that she's just launching, Financial Times Guide to Mentoring. Dr. Ruth Gotian is the Chief Learning Officer at Weill Cornell Medicine in New York. She's also a globally recognized mentor uh, that has won multiple awards, been recognized by Forbes as the number one emerging management thinker by Thinkers50 exclusive group of leaders and executives uh, and one of the top 20 mentors worldwide has uh, previously talked to us here at All Out Coach about her book called The Success Factor, which I know I have utilized in my mentorship programs and in my conversations with leaders in the pharmaceutical industry. And we are going to talk about how mentorship impacts our business bottom line, you know, that, that when we look back at our career, I know I, when I do, when I reflect every transition, every highlight, every success I've had, I trace it back to the mentors I've had. So Dr. Gautian, great to have you here again. Congratulations once again on your new book. Thank you. I'm excited to be back. I want to start by asking you about how formal mentorship really should be. What are the advantages and disadvantages between formal and informal mentorship programs? Yeah, so you know that that is a great way to kick this off because I have a surprising statistic for everyone. Most mentoring relationships, sixty one percent of them are actually not formal. they're they're informal. They happened organically. And that is to say that, you are you have the opportunity to meet people who can help you every single day and you don't need to have a formal structure where you meet every other tuesday at four o'clock with an agenda and meeting notes in order to propel your career forward it can be those informal interactions which are so helpful now all that there is very much a place for formal mentorship programs as well because formal mentorship programs really help, especially those who, for whatever reason, are not comfortable asking for guidance, don't know how to approach people for mentorship, or having trouble finding somebody. This provides a starting point if there's a formal program. It's a launching pad. And the mentors hopefully are trained in how to do this effectively to draw out what is so great in their mentees. And maybe long term, those formal relationships blossom. Maybe it's time to pivot and find someone else, but I think it's a fantastic starting point. Well, uh, I, I, you know, in my introduction, uh, I did not mention your your mentorship through your writing as well. 
and your leadership uh, through your regular editorials uh, and then pieces that I've had a chance to read, uh, journals such as Nature, Forbes, Harvard Business Review, where you share a lot of statistics and practical case studies as well, which uh, you also focus on in this book with Andy Lopata, your co-author. And you discuss the importance of mentors being outside of the direct line of management. Yeah. Could you elaborate on why that is crucial for effective mentoring and uh, how can organizations ensure this separation? There's a few, a few reasons why that's important. First of all, let me start by saying, I'm not saying they shouldn't be your, your line manager should not, I'm not saying they shouldn't be your mentor. I'm saying they shouldn't uh-huh. be your only mentor because okay. certain things can happen, which would not be to your advantage. First of all, if they mentor you too well, then you are going to go for a promotion, going for another job, and then they're left with this gaping hole that they need to fill. And until they fill that hole, they might need to do that work themselves. So that's one reason why they shouldn't be your only mentor. The second reason is, what if they leave? We know that the average tenure at any organization is now 4.2 years. So, and this is the the article that Andy Lapata and I just wrote with a officer from the U.S. Army, uh, Dr. Chevy Cook. In the Army, they switch roles every two years. So if, if the person you're reporting to becomes your mentor and they leave for their next job, then you're left without a mentor. So you need to diversify who you have as a mentor. One, because they may leave, right? Two, because if they do too good a job, you may leave, and then they're stuck without one. So you have to really balance that out. And one of the ways to balance that out is with a mentoring team that has diverse viewpoints, people within your industry, outside your industry, senior to you, at your level, junior to you. It just gives you so many more perspectives and opportunities to hear those perspectives. You sh- share about uh, some of those case studies, which hopefully we can get into uh, during our discussion here. Does does this really mean that we're looking for shared experiences with our colleagues uh, who may be junior to us, senior to us? How can we identify those potential informal mentors then within uh, your organization? I think it could be shared experiences, but more importantly, it's shared values. So mm-hmm. the forward of the book is written by Steve Kerr. Steve Kerr is a nine-time NBA champion. He's the coach of the yeah. Golden State Warriors and now of Team USA. And what he writes about in his forward, when he retired as a player, he was a broadcaster. And then he knew he wanted to be a coach. And he actually approached his mentor, who's a coach of a football team. And he understood, right? He was following him. He was observing him. He was talking to him. And then his mentor said to him, how are you going to coach your team? And he said, oh, I have these drills. I have these defense things. I have this. And he said, no, how are you going to coach your team? What kind of culture are you going to create? So here was his mentor who was in a different sport altogether, who dropped Mm -hmm. a seed in his head of, it's not about the technical aspect so much, but it's about the values that you are bringing to the team. So when Mm -hmm. you're looking for a mentor, you want someone who's going to bring that out of you. And it's very helpful when you have shared values with your mentor. Ultimately, mentorship matters and it can probably make miracles happen. Uh, things that are that you otherwise thought were impossible, which I know yeah. some of your protagonists in your book and, and, and in your case studies mention. You know that. You know what? I'm just not, going not, to right. I I just whipped the book off the shelf, mm-hmm. um, and I just want to. I see I have post-it notes all over. Um, I am going to just give you some of the statistics, just so that you see how incredible it can sure. be. Ninety um, percent of those who are mentored are satisfied with their jobs. And more than half are very satisfied. So, you know, we hear all these people who are just going to work as a job. It's just something they do. But people who are mentored truly enjoy it. Those who are mentored are earning significantly more. Um, And uh, 89% of those who are mentored 
So that's almost nine out of 10 mm -hmm. feel their contributions are valued by their colleagues. They feel like they're part of a team that what they do matters. And 70% of those who are mentored share that their company offers them excellent or good opportunities for advancement, while only 47% of those without mentors share the same sentiment. So those who are mentored are earning more, they're getting promoted more often, they enjoy their career more, they have less burnout. And it's, it's not just about what's so great for the person being mentored, it's also great for the organization because somebody who, a, an employee, when they leave, it costs a lot of money to replace them. Yeah. So having them mentored, it's actually a great retention tool because those who are mentored are more likely to stay with the organization and they're going to do their greatest work because remember, they're happy at work. And this is a challenge, I think, that's consistent across the different industries mm -hmm. that we have. I know it's true in, in, in mine and pharma in pharmaceuticals and healthcare and the shortage of physicians in, in healthcare as well. Um, so, uh, so you talked, uh, you know, a bit about diversifying your, your experience, your outlook, uh, a strategy to be more profitable, to be, uh, to provide more quality work, to retain employees. Now, what, are some of those barriers though in actually making that first step and starting a mentorship program whether it be formal or informal among executives who have to probably sponsor it or champion mm -hmm. it what are some of these common misconceptions that you have continuously i'm sure uh, ran into yeah. so some of the for the formal uh challenges part of the problem is i have never seen one that's done really really well and the problem is First of all, who owns it? Who's in mm -hmm. charge of it? Who's responsible for it? So let's say it's HR or L&D, right? Or an employee resource group. That's great. They're in charge of organizing it, but who's there? Who, who holds accountability? Are the mentors and mentees meeting? Who is training the mentors and how to do it? We put a lot of training with mentees, but not so much with mentors. What's the accountability? How do we know that it's working? What's the exit ramp if it's not working? How were these matches made? And I can tell you after talking to so many organizations, they're pretty random, right? They'll say, oh, you're both from New York. Yeah. Oh, you both went to the same school. Therefore, you're mm -hmm. a good match. Well, not mm -hmm. everyone from New York is the same. So that's preposterous to, mm -hmm. to think that's how you match people. Of course. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the challenges. Um, but it does help those people who don't always have the access. And again, as I said, don't know how to how to find people and how to start that conversation. It, it helps to have something. Now, for the informal mentoring relationships, there's two parts. I think it's the mentee's responsibility mm -hmm. to seek out the mentors because nobody's looking, right? The mentors aren't looking, oh, who can I mentor today, yeah. right? But the mentees need the guidance. And the challenge that the mentees have is they'll often go up to someone and they'll say, Tim, can you help me with my career? Well, yeah. where do you even start with that? Yeah, right? It's general. too vague. Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. long do we need to, how long is this discussion going to take? <laughs> right? It's just, it's way too much. It sounds like mm -hmm. an obligation. But what if I said, I am looking to work on this particular challenge I'm working on this project. I'm stuck on this one area. I know you have experience with it. Can I talk to you for 15 minutes so you can hear what I'm doing and maybe guide me as to what I'm missing? Well, now I know mm -hmm. what it's about. Now I know how long it's going to take. It's very, very different conversation. And what mm -hmm. happens is when a mentee does that, takes the initiative and starts showing that they do really good work, the mentor then is more likely to approach them and to help them. All the research has shown this, and this happens time and time again, but the mentee has to take the first step. Now, if a mentor mm -hmm. wakes up in the morning and says, I really want to mentor someone today, and they're scouting people, right. <laughs> here's, what, here's what I really want you to look for. I want you to look for those people who are taking the initiative. I want you to look for the people who are curious and asking the questions, and I wonder what would happen if, and what about that? Because those are the people who are constantly scanning and constantly looking and, and constantly wondering how to do it better or more effectively or more efficiently or faster. 
Those mm-hmm. are the people that you want to mentor because they're constantly looking to improve. So formal or informal, both have their pluses and minuses, but there are ways mm-hmm. to make both even better. Mm-hmm. Okay. And now your book offers many very detailed guides because yeah. ultimately you need those details, which I think you alluded to earlier, uh, knowing more about potential matches in order to make sure that both sides have the same vision and understanding of mentorship. Yeah. Right? So you provide the, those as well in your book, I understand. Now, uh, what changes uh, in the career trajectory in terms of the needs for mentorship, um, right? As, as you become more senior, right, or you have more responsibilities, you may have less time to learn informally. Yes. One of the biggest takeaways I, you know, for me, from our first conversation when you um, were a guest, uh, Dr. Gautian, was uh, the value of informal learning. The, yes. the, and how, yeah, based on all the research and case studies mm-hmm. that you had shared, that becomes very challenging for some of the seniors and executives, right? You know, once they, uh, and, and the time is also very much of a huge limitation today, right? They feel mm-hmm. like, oh, look, I can't really commit myself to scouting, like you mentioned, some, some mentee mm-hmm. and, 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 you know, and, and being yep. a part of this mentorship program. How do you, uh, I don't know, how do you address those barriers in a, you know, and what, what, would, what would be some of your suggestions to some of these exe- you know, executives, let's say? You know, it's interesting. <laughs> First of all, when it comes to informal learning, I am around yes. really busy people. I'm a social scientist who studies extreme yes. high achievers, right? Yeah. The yes. Nobel Prize winners, the astronauts, the Olympians, the NBA champions. Trust me when I tell you they are super busy. When I was communicating with Steve Kerr about the forward, either he was in an airport or I was in an airport. <laughs> That's how he, constantly. And he was saying, I have a flight to wherever he was going. I'm going to work on it then. So they learn to constantly optimize their time. Trust me, nobody listens to podcasts or books better than super busy people, right? When they're driving or something Mm -hmm. like that, they're able to, instead of just tuning things out there, they're listening in order to learn. Right. So um, I think that is very critical in order to do that. Now, people who are busy, they make time. Half of the Nobel Prize winners were mentored by other Nobel Prize winners. Now, you can't tell me Nobel Prize winners aren't busy, but people like to bet on winners. Mentees need to prove that they have winning potential. And you do that by asking for the stretch assignments, by showing that Mm -hmm. initiative, by showing that curiosity. And trust me, when you do that, people will make time. I get text messages and emails from some of the busiest people in the world, but they answer when they, it's something that they want to invest their time in because they're interested. So I I think people will make time for people who show that they are that winning material. Mm -hmm. Yeah. uh, Yeah. I appreciate those insights very much. Uh, So I have a specific question based on my personal experience. Uh, co-founding a mentorship program in the pharma industry for the medical affairs professional society in 2020. <clears throat> and that's, and it's in regards to the structure of that mentorship, because it follows on what you just, I think, asked in terms of just making time giving assignments you mentioned. And that makes, makes me think of Benjamin Franklin saying, of course, uh, tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn. What part of that time should be devoted to just informal conversations, let's say, versus assignments based on your... I think it, it it's different for every single person. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I, I want to take you back to the beginning of the pandemic, March 2020. I was in quarantine. I'm an extrovert, 95% extrovert. So being in quarantine yeah. in one room away from my family yeah. was yeah. torture. And I reached out to every person who was way out of my league but i wanted to write with them and they never i never thought they'd give me the time of day because they were too busy because they were so out of my league but i said they're home like me what else are they doing i said i have nothing to lose if i ask 
if they're willing to write an article with me. And I gave them the topic. I didn't just say, will you write an article with me? And I explained why I thought they were the right people. And I said, will you write with me if I ask them? I gave them the opportunity to say yes. And I did that early on in the pandemic. And that led me to work with two people who I really, really looked up to. And I said, this is what I want to do. And I want to put it in the lay press. And we wrote together. And what I learned from that process, I wrote the first draft. And then they each edited it in such a way that I now know how to submit to top tier journals because I saw mm. through their eyes because they've done it so many times. And that's what I learned from them. And then when I had to pitch it to all of these journals, they let me try it, right? And they gave me a safety net. What was the worst that was going to happen, right? So I learned to do that and they coached me through that, mentored me through that. And then when there was the issue, I was the only female author there were three of us. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm an academic. So being first author is a very big deal. And they mm -hmm. moved me from first to middle, one of the journals. For no, it was a mistake, but they couldn't get it fixed. And finally, the senior person, he said, isn't it ironic that we're talking about the mentoring of women and the one female author was moved to the middle slot? Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. took that, right? Mm -hmm. he, he put his reputation on the line for that. And I said, that's how it's done. So I got to, to learn by doing, by trying all these things, but also by observing how they did it. And I think that's part of the stretch assignment. I was doing things I had never done mm -hmm. at that point. Yeah. So I think there's the opportunity to learn as well and learn by doing and learn by observing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And mentors could probably be proactive right even though it's it's the some of the most effective programs mentorship programs are those that are guided by the mentee mm -hmm. as i think you had mentioned earlier it sounds like the mentor also has to uh, provide that just just push right or yeah give those assignments as well right but they said to me what do you want to work on right so it's not like mm -hmm. here's some random busy work it's how right. is this related right it has to be right. relatable and as the mentee is the one who um, comes, you know, makes that first step. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the topics, some of the delicate topics that are now timely also, which you highlight through some of your case studies. Um, you mentioned being a woman, um, you know, I, sometimes women may selectively choose a mentor who's a, a woman or a mentee or somebody who has maybe represents a minority ethnic group for example is there an advantage from finding somebody who let's say looks like you who thinks like you who may be outside of your direct line of management as you suggest you know what does some of the evidence show and uh, what are some of your tips uh, so i think there's pluses and minuses um okay. if you definitely want someone who has gone through what you went through go or are going mm -hmm. through or who looks like you because there's there's a type of empathy that you can't teach yep. there these are shared experiences right and i think mm -hmm. that that is so so helpful the problem is for those who are in underrepresented groups or women if you're looking for mentors who look just like you in those senior leadership roles there're just not that many out there and if they're so busy mentoring other people when do they have time to do their job that's number 1 number 2 if those are the only mentors that you have those who look like you you're going to be in an echo chamber and you're not going to hear other perspectives. You're not going to hear other solutions. You're not going to hear mm -hmm. about other opportunities because mm -hmm. you're in this one world and you want to hear how things are done elsewhere. That's yeah. how we solve the biggest problems. IDEO, the biggest product design company, mm -hmm. purposely mixes their teams. There's engineers and a marketing person and a healthcare person and a psychologist and a statistician. They're all brought together and mixed in because when you have different people together, you get these different ideas percolating and that's what you want. So what are some surprises or unexpected benefits or insights that emerged from writing this book, Financial Times Guide to Mentoring? Uh, so my co-author, Andy Lapata, 
He's based in the UK. Mm -hmm. I am based in New York. Yeah. I write in American English. He writes oh. in British English. <laughs> <laughs> So you can imagine um, what that was like at the beginning. Um, <laughs> but what was interesting, and a lot of people don't know this, Andy and I had never met in person until after we submitted the entire manuscript to the publisher. That was the first time we met in person when I happened to go to London for the Thinker's 50 Gala. Yeah, so you can write a book with someone you have never mm -hmm. met in person. So mm -hmm. when people tell me you need to meet somebody in person in order to really get into that professional relationship with them, no, you don't. No, you don't. And yeah. we're proof. Now, how did you complement each other? Can you talk a little bit about his background and how it worked synergistically with, yeah. with your approach? So a Andy yeah. Lapata is Europe's leading strategist in networking strategies and networking relationships. And mm -hmm. I'm an academic, I'm a social scientist. I used to be a dean for mentoring. So we brought two different approaches to solve the same problem. And what we did was we integrated those two approaches when we wrote the book. It's also two different cultures. So we had to see mm -hmm. where the difference is. And that there was something to be said about that because mentors in the United States do not get paid, for example. Or in Europe, they often do. So mm. we had, right, that was a learning experience for me as well. Um, and so I think that was interesting when we shared ideas. But from a process perspective, Andy is very much the process guy. And I am the let's do it, right? He mapped out every section of every chapter. I mean, we did it together, but he was insistent that we do that. And I'm more of let's just get in front of the laptop and start writing. Um, yeah. but to get us to slow down, to really think about it really, mm -hmm. I think made the book so much stronger. But what we also learned was that each one of us has strengths in different things and each one needs to leverage those strengths. And if I'm not the process person, I wasn't going to try to start to be the process person. I learned a lot in the process of seeing how Andy does it. Mm -hmm. But I was more about the writing. I was more about the academic integrity of the book. You know, if we're going to make claims, there has to be research to back it up. I am the marketing person. I love to do the marketing. Um, and so we each learned how to leverage what we're really good at while teaching the other one how to do it as well. So that I thought was really fun. I want to go back to one thing that you said before, which was uh, mentorship. Mentorship allows you to plant seeds. Yeah. The benefits of which you may not reap until you know long, long down the road, for example. Yeah. And, and uh, what are some of those metrics or performance metrics that you need to keep an eye on if you're starting a mentorship program in your organization for the first time? How do you tell when it is successful? Look, there are things you can measure and there are things that you can't. Is the person okay, being promoted? Are their performance appraisals better, right? All those mm -hmm. things you can measure. There's a number attached to it. Mm -hmm. But there's things that are very hard to measure, at least in the yeah. workplace. Is the person's self-confidence, has that improved? Are they communicating mm -hmm. better? Are they trying to communicate their ideas better? Are they trying new challenges that they haven't tried before, right? So there are right. some things that are more challenging to wrap your head around. Um, but at the end of the day, you know when it's working because you see people improving. You see people happier in their jobs. You see people getting promoted. You see people being more productive. All those things show that it's working. Yeah, yeah and I'm very glad that um, Financial Times also has taken their name and uh, provided a lot of practical uh, yeah. meaning in, in terms of business as well uh, to mentoring for those who may think oh mentoring is uh, you know is, is kind of complex or nebulous to some and I don't know how to start I'm really hoping uh, that this book uh, really uh, you know, fills those gaps what are you most proud of, of from achieving in, from this book together with Andy and what would you like the readers also to take away from it look it was a risk because we had not worked 
on anything of this magnitude before mm-hmm. together. We had worked on other smaller things. Um, but it was, it worked and I'm glad I did it. I'm really glad I did it. And I would work with Andy again in a heartbeat, um, because I think it worked well and he's very different than I am, but it's the, it's the differences that taught us. We, we learned how to appreciate those differences and learn from those differences. And I think it made the book so much better. You know, people ask us, did you disagree on anything? Yeah. Um, there are two things we disagreed on. Mm -hmm. Um, but you don't see us kicking and screaming in the book. We actually, in the book where we disagreed, we actually showed both sides so that the reader can make their own decision. Wow. And we didn't push one or the other. We just said, the authors don't agree on this. Here are the two options. We leave it up to you to decide what's right for you. Well, th- thanks for leaving us with that intrigue there. Uh <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to elaborate on that because we'll have to read the book. Uh, yes. Unless you... <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> um, great. Well, it's been a pleasure to, to speak to you again, uh, Dr. Gautian. Uh, and uh, I wish you lots of success with uh, this book so that it, sh- it spreads the right ideas that you both wanted to with the audiences. And you have already, I think, utilized so many different examples from many different industries in this book from sports from various different fields and i I have a feeling it's going to be relevant to many uh what what are you working on next after the launch goes well just let's finish with that how are you stretching yourself and lifting others well um i am writing lots and lots and lots of articles um in forbes and psychology today and fast company and harvard business review just to get the word out about mentoring and how to do it and how to do it well Mm -hmm. and collaborating with different people each time. So there was an article in Harvard Business Review where I collaborated with an astronaut and now an article in Fast Company where I collaborated with an officer from the U.S. Army. So you never know who I'm going to be writing with, maybe an NBA champion. Okay, (laughs) great. Great. That's a great way to finish this part. And I'm sure you'll be back to share some new insights soon. Hopefully. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tien. Thank you.